Hi, I'm Ali Patterson and welcome to The Fintech Show. The past year has seen changes in all walks of life and the world of payments is no different. The rapid increase in digitized payments has been astronomical and whilst from a customer experience perspective, lots might have changed, we're gonna to have to delve a little deeper into discovering what other areas of the value chain have been affected by this increase in digital payments. We're also going to be looking into the evolution of payments, delving into all things cloud payments, whether they are the future of payments, and what can be achieved by banks by converting from legacy systems to some nice new updated cloud systems. To get to the heart of what cloud payments are and what they have to offer, we spoke to payments expert Mike Walters from Form3, the guys providing banks and regulated fintechs alike end-to-end -end managed payment services through a slick single API. With digital payments in mind, we also spoke to John Leons from TSB, the retail bank that began, well, over 200 years ago and has a committed workforce serving around 5 million customers. Whilst John might not have been there at the beginning, he's certainly a key figure now as the Director of Operations at TSB. Also joining me is Avalyn Villaglox from ING. Avalyn is the Global Director of Payments at ING, so we'll be able to shed a lot of light on the past, present and future of payments. How has the payments industry changed in the last 12 to 18 months? Has the pandemic increased customer demand when it comes to payment experience? What are some of the new demand of customers in payments? Mm. <laughs> what a year it's been. Um, <laughs> It, it, you know, I, I was thinking about, you know, today and it, in some respects, nothing's changed. And in other respects, everything's changed. And the way I kind of tend to think about things is in in layers and kind of layer one is your central infrastructure. Layer three, if you like, is, you know, the, at the front end of the value chain, which is our customer experience. And then you've got, you know, the, 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 the banks and the bit in the middle that does all the processing. And really from a uh, from a central perspective, central infrastructure, yeah, not much has changed. The agenda is the agenda. We all know what we're doing. We, there's a significant program of re, uh, renewal and regeneration covering CHAPS, RTGS, the new payments architecture, becoming ISO compliant, all those good things carry on. So in that respect, nothing's changed. It's a multi-year program. If I jump to the other end of the value chain, the customer end, everything's changed massive change in the last year um, we've seen checks down by 24 percent we've seen faster payments grow by 10 percent tsb alone we've seen our digital adoption you know skyrocket you know now in excess of 90 percent of all of our customer interactions are digitally so you know it's changed a lot from a from a front-end customer um, experience perspective um, but you know, for the banks in the middle, what's it meant for us? It, it's meant that we've had to, you know, get used to working remotely, serving our customers from a distance. It's required us to accelerate our digital enablement. You know, we've introduced things like smart agent, um, a web chat capability. Um, we've done partnerships with Adobe to try and accelerate our uh, interaction with customers digitally. Um, and so we and we've had to support our customers through some fairly difficult times, as as many of the banks have done. So nothing's changed and everything's changed is what I would say. Um, increased increased demand digitally, just driven by the fact that people weren't able to travel. It's, it's very obvious. And we've, we've heard a lot of it you know, from a lot of the commentators across the industry, particularly growth in mobile versus web. You know, we actually, in some respects, see a decline in web usage as people really get comfortable with using their, their mobile um, device. Now for TSB, we, we, we have a branch capability. We have a branch network. We're very proud of it. And it's part of our core core proposition. Um, so whilst the digital um, enablement has increased and customers enjoy um, that digital experience, um, that doesn't mean that we are um, leaving behind those customers that still want to operate face to face analog still work in the analog world yeah. um, and invariably these customers are probably more vulnerable in society than, than others so it's important that we don't all get carried away with this digital agenda uh, and leave behind um, a very important part of our customer base so um the digitization of payments has been 
kind of rapid, uh, which is which is a good thing. From a consumer point of view, has, has this sort of highlighted some of the failures of legacy systems? And is is, is the cloud the, the silver bullet the answer? Cloud is cloud is a fantastic thing, um, uh, and and I think uh, that cloud has a role to play in in the way that uh, customers maintain their their flexibility. Um, and I think particularly when you see you know rapid changes in demand, one of the real strengths of a, a well put together uh, platform based um, cloud uh, based service um, is its ability to handle scale and its ability to um, to really. Um, sort of put up with those changing behaviors on really quite short notice and, and i think that's one of the things that's you know really um come to the fore over the last 12 or 18 months um that there can be very rapid changes in payment activity and payment trends um, i think up up to that point um you know much longer uh, much more uh, well telegraphed sort of trend based uh, change in payment activity but it really does show that um, businesses need to be able to react with scale and resilience um, and with really, really high levels of automation to deal with quite interesting changes in dynamics about, you know, no access to local data centres, restricted access to local data centres, lack of public transport to support that. Um, you know, all of those things really put under strain um, models which are not using the, the, the really um, fantastic tools and capabilities of the cloud. So we have a rapid increase in the volume of payments while the transaction value itself is decreasing. How can banks stay competitive against this backdrop in the payments ecosystem? So for banks to stay competitive uh, in, in the payment ecosystem, um, I, I think there are a number of things um, that they really need to be, uh, need to be focused on. Um, the, the first of those is, the, um, is just the resilience and the uh, the scalability of their infrastructure. So, um, you know, that's not just about keeping the lights on, it's about doing that uh, quickly and doing that affordably in unknown circumstances. And, and you know, cloud has proved itself to be really um, resilient uh, in, the, in that. Um, you've only really got to look at the amount of sort of digital content, um, you know, video, video remote activity, uh, as well as the payment landscape to see how, you know, fantastically well um, cloud um, services have coped with, um, you know, very, very rapid change in customer behaviour. Um, I think though, again, back to payments, I think it's important um, the banks are not just looking at that scalability piece, they're also looking at how quickly change can be deployed. Um, and again, one of the features of modern technology is the ability to roll out change four, five, six, 10, 15 times a day into those production environments. And that allows for um, uh, taking advantage of opportunity, but it also allows for, for maintenance and, and the ongoing um, delivery of payments. Um, and, and I think all of those things um, also really expose the need for uh, that to be done in a professional and secure way. Um, and, and so that I think also pushes those financial institutions towards, um, you know, real specialists in their fields, um, both from a technology perspective, but also um, domain experience um, in payment specifically. We, we've got to talk about the cloud because I mean, that, that's the you know, sprinkle a bit of cloud and everything's fine. Do, do you think that cloud technology is the, is the answer, is the silver bullet to solving some of these uh, issues? Uh, so working in the cloud is uh, um, uh, is is helping us uh, to be more flexible uh, and also to reduce cost. I, uh, let's to be let's be honest there, but I don't think cloud in itself it's it's more a technology. And with technology, it's always what you do with that. So um, and yes, I think cloud technology is here. It's here to stay. If you look to ING, we also uh, work with cloud uh, technology, and that is also where we're moving towards. But as I said before, it's much more what you do with that cloud technology. What what uh, solution do you uh, make available uh, via via that technology? So I wouldn't say that this is the answer, <laughs> but it's part of the answer, and it's it, it's really an enabler. What are some of the um, improvements that real-time payments offer customers beyond, you know, the payments being faster? Is there an opportunity for things like uh, invoice attachments and such? 
Uh, so real-time uh, real payments um, uh, offer a range of different um, uh, sort of changes in customer experience. So, so clearly uh, they're faster, uh, clues in the name, I suppose. Uh, they're faster, uh, but, um, but actually uh, that's really important. So, you know, there is a really big difference between a 10 or 15 second transaction and a one second transaction in terms of the type of user experience that drives. One enables, um, you know, a, a, a logged in um, in session experience uh, and one doesn't. One involves, uh, you know, how do I refresh? How do I come back later? How do I find out if something's happened? And, and, and really, you know, that makes a big difference. Um, but it's not just the speed. So the, the change in uh, technology to allow for um, the carrying of incremental information um, is also really, really important. And this is a trend I think we're going to see continue um, at pace with the adoption of uh, large scale ISO 2022 um, infrastructures. So the ability for not just the payment information, but invoicing information, even image information to be transported alongside um, payments themselves. And I think that will that will revolutionize the type of customer experience we see uh, around payments. We have a growing SME franchise uh, at TSB and our, um, our, our customers uh, are desperate for the tooling that makes them, them more efficient. And I think all those things that sit around the core payments journey uh, are going to proliferate, uh, I think, as, as we move forward, and none more so than in the, the SME market. Yeah. I guess my view would be that the pandemic has has really accelerated that march from analog to digital, you know, from cash and checks uh, onto cards and bank-to-bank and -bank payments. And I, I don't see that reversing. Um, open banking is the, is the really interesting area. That's growing significantly. I see it in the volumes every day. Customers, more customers are initiating payments from within third-party apps than they've ever done before. And I think those two things are you know, significant weather vanes for us all. And post pandemic, I see a growing proportion of our payments initiated outside of the banking mobile app um, through, through open banking, rather than in the traditional, you know, bank mobile, uh, mobile app. So payment initiation shift, I can see happening um, uh, as a post um, um, uh, post pandemic um, theme. I also foresee uh, um, a move from um, card acceptance to instant faster payments, particularly in e-commerce, um, as those smaller businesses try to avoid expensive merchant acquiring costs. And, and as this capability is now far more instant, you know, it's starting to knock on the door of the traditional uh, card rails as a viable alternative for the movement of money. And so, you know, just over time, I think those two things are just going to drive a dematerialization of payment initiation, where actually the payment will become quite invisible and roll off the back of the customer experience, whatever the customer is doing in whatever app or e-commerce experience. Um, they're in. And, and that may not just be for e-commerce. I could see that beginning to um, seep into the point of sale over time as well. So that's my view about life after pandemic and how real time payments kicks on and creates more value to, to customers, both consumer and SMEs. What are some of your, um, your recommendations to large financial organisations with significant legacy systems in, uh, in this situation? So I think Form 3's recommendation to, to large providers who are uh, recognising a, a need for, for change in their technology estate, I think the first is we, we absolutely believe that the benefits of public cloud um, outweigh uh, any um, restriction or, or, or any um, reason not to use them. So, you know, resilience, security, scalability, cost effectiveness, all of those things. Um, so we would encourage um, financial institutions to embrace um, the use of cloud technology, um, particularly cloud ways of working around development, maintenance and um, full embracing of, of, of DevOps models. Um, I think the second thing um, that we would encourage um, our customers and, and other institutions to look at um, it is the conversion of those banking technology estates into platforms that can consume other platforms. Uh, and we think that's really important because it means best of breed capability, 
in each area without the need to manage it, host it and run it um, yourself. Um, and, and, and that doesn't apply just to payments, that applies to fraud, sanction screening uh, and a number of other services that would be um, core to a bank's activity. And then I suppose the third thing that we would um, we would suggest um, it is really um, it's become significantly easier to test out this type of technology. And so what we see from a lot of clients is you know very rapid um, development activity to prove um, you know how integrations would work and to do more than proof of concept. You know to do real world activity, but to do real world activity you know at smaller scale so that they can learn really about how these technologies um, can can help them before they're evolved onto the main platforms. Well, I kind of want to bring together what we talked about in terms of the cloud and in terms of regulation. Does the cloud enable you to adhere to regulations and future regulations in a much more seamless way? Uh, yes, uh, it is on one part. And on the other hard part, it, it triggers some uh, additional things that you need to secure. Um, uh, and uh, so cyber security is really a key uh, key item uh, to uh, to be addressed and that we address. Um, but yes, cloud. So I think cloud solves some of the issues and uh, uh, brings new, no, not challenges would be too big a word, but uh, uh, new things that we need to take care of um, altogether. Can cloud-based platforms enable an organization of your size to adopt these regulations seamlessly mm. I, I was i was with you up to until you used the word seamlessly i'm always cautious about you know seamlessly right inevitably i think um cloud could certainly make um putting new services live a less disruptive experience um i, I absolutely feel it's got a role to play whether you know it constitutes seamlessly i think re remains to be seen there is a huge amount of technical choreography that's required behind the scenes to to make that possible particularly when you know part of the customer journey is potentially in the cloud and part of the customer journey journey is on prem within our banks you know that transition back and forwards is is something that needs to be seen and, and proven um, but i think it's got a role to play i think it will um, help with um, cost effectiveness as we talked about before and i think the real question for the smaller banks is can they do this themselves do they have the critical mass to do it do they have the wherewithal to do it and do they need a partner to do it with and help them and if they do how much does the bank do versus how much does the partner do so i think we're going to start to see some real significant questions about uh, how much of the end-to-end -end value chain for payment stays with the traditional banks as it has for many years and how much of this now starts to sit in a much wider ecosystem for payments going forward so i think we've touched a bit on on uh, cloud helping with um uh, regulation um before but but i i think you know, when you apply it to the payments landscape, particularly for those financial institutions that operate in different markets, using different payment schemes and different customer groups, you know, this really is a complex uh, environment. And, you know, that that in some respects is um, is made easier by the use of um, organisations that specialise in making sure that technology is ready and fit for purpose and compliant. Um, and, and, and so I think, um, you know, that's where Form 3 operate in payments. It's where a number of other organisations operate in, in sort of parallel services. Um, but it's not just down to the banks themselves to understand the answer to these questions. Um, finding the right partners to help, not just, you know, through the technology deployment, but also, you know, the business understanding of, of, of how to make this um, work and stay relevant is, is really important. And, and we pride ourselves on that. Well, that's all we've got time for on today's episode of The Fintech Show. I hope you've enjoyed hearing about the future of payments. As of all of our guests mentioned, the huge uptake in digital payments has undoubtedly shaped attitudes to new technologies with the future pointing to the direction of the cloud and cloud payments. Will checks and cash become a thing of the distant path very soon? Well, we'll have to see. I wish John, Evelyn, Mike, and you all the very best of luck. Thanks for watching. Bye for now.